Historical events and timelines are depicted as level and evenly incremental, but history is not. History is like a roller coaster going up and down and all around. We're learning that time is more like history, and not much is equally proportioned the way timelines make it appear to be. Welcome to What Date Was Jesus Born? How do holidays and traditions help bring people together and strengthen social structures? Who combined pagan traditions with Christian traditions? Did Jesus' birth actually occur on December 25th, or are there historical and biblical reasons to consider alternative dates. Why did early historians like Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Eusebius provide varying accounts of Jesus' birth date, and how does this impact our understanding of the timeline? How does the death of Herod the Great play a role in dating Jesus' birth, and what evidence supports the idea that Herod may have died later than a few records identified? What astronomical events are suggested to have occurred around the time of Jesus' birth, and how do they factor into the discussion? Why do some scholars argue against the traditional date of December 25 for Jesus' birth, pointing to connections with pagan practices and Roman holidays. What roles do historical figures like Ignatius, Polycarp, and Clement of Rome play in shaping our understanding of early Christian traditions and the celebration of Jesus' birth? How does the Passover connection contribute to the idea that John the Baptist was born on Passover and Jesus 280 days later on the Feast of Trumpets? In what ways did early Christian writers and historians use available information, and what collections or libraries were accessible to them when documenting events like Jesus' birth? What are some unconventional ways to celebrate Jesus' birthday detached from today's commercialism and traditional Christmas practices? Why is it essential to reconsider the meaning of holidays and challenge manipulative systems as highlighted in the discussion about Jesus' birthday? Is it really possible to tell what date Jesus was born? What are holidays for? Are they evil and how in the world could it be possible to know? This is Robbie Usley, and I'm sharing an option of understanding the birth date of Jesus. If nothing else, it provides a way to think about the date and how much is involved. Please click the thumb up like button and free subscribe button below this video because there are plenty more thought provoking videos to come. I'm ready, are you? So let's get to it. The biblical account of the shepherds being in the fields with their flocks at the time of Jesus' birth is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verse 8, New International Version. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. The exact time of year is not specified in the Bible, but it's worth noting that shepherds typically brought their flocks in at night during the colder months, such as winter, to protect them from the cold. Therefore, the presence of shepherds in the fields with their flocks suggests a time of year when the weather was milder, spring through fall. As for Roman administrators approving registrations for travel during winter, there is historical evidence suggesting that traveling during the winter months, especially in regions with challenging weather conditions, would have been discouraged. The Roman historian Josephus, in his work, The Jewish War, Book 4, Chapter 8, Verse 3, indicated that winter travel in Judea could be difficult. But Caesar, when winter was come on, removed into a more commodious house, which he built about Jericho, near to the fountains of Jordan, and named it Julius. This passage also reflects the practice of avoiding military campaigns and other significant activities during the winter months. It implies that winter conditions, including travel, were considered less favorable, Given these considerations, the biblical account of the shepherds in the fields aligns with a time of the year when the weather would permit such activity, reinforcing the idea that Jesus' birth didn't occur near the winter months traditionally associated with Christmas. Statements from Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Eusebius regarding the birth of Jesus also helps narrow down when Jesus was born. Here's a brief overview of their statements and their relevance to Jesus' birth. Quintus Septimius Florence Tertullianus, commonly known as Tertullian, was a prolific early Christian author and apologist who lived in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. He is often regarded as one of the founders of Western theology and Latin Christian literature. Tertullian was born around 160 AD and specifically stated that Augustus began to rule 41 years before the birth of Jesus, and died 15 years after that event on August 19th in the year 14 AD. 
This information is significant because it establishes a specific time frame for Jesus' birth in relation to the reign of Augustus, a key historical figure. Tertullian's information can be used to infer the likely date of Jesus' birth. Irenaeus of Lyons was an early Christian theologian and bishop who lived in the second century. He is best known for his work Against Heresies. A noted apologist born about a century after Jesus specifically mentioned that the Lord was born in the 41st year of the reign of Augustus. This statement corroborates with the information provided by Tertullian, reinforcing the idea that the timing of Jesus' birth can easily be linked to the reign of Augustus. Eusebius of Caesarea, also known as Eusebius Pamphili, was an early Christian historian and bishop. He is best known for his ecclesiastical history, a comprehensive historical work that covers the early history of Christianity up to his own time. Eusebius played a crucial role in preserving and transmitting historical information about the early Christian church. Eusebius lived from 264 AD to 340 AD and was often referred to as the father of church history. He ascribed the birth of Jesus to the 42nd year of the reign of Augustus and the 28th year from the subjection of Egypt upon the death of Anthony and Cleopatra. Eusebius's statement further supports the connection between the timing of Jesus' birth and specific historical events, providing additional historical context. In summary, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Eusebius were early Christian writers and historians who made statements or provided information used to support the argument for a particular date of Jesus' birth. Their statements contribute to the broader historical and chronological framework used by scholars and researchers to estimate the likely time of Jesus' birth. Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Eusebius were early Christian writers and historians who lived in the 2nd to 4th centuries. Their information about the time of Jesus' birth would have been derived from various sources, including oral traditions, existing written accounts, and possibly some historical records available to them. It's important to note that during their time, the concept of precise historical documentation, as we understand it today, was different. Here's how they might have gathered information. Oral tradition. In the early Christian community, oral tradition played a significant role in passing down stories about Jesus, his life, and key events. Eyewitnesses or individuals who had direct contact with those who witnessed events in Jesus' life could have contributed to the oral transmission of information. Written sources, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Eusebius were familiar with various written sources, including the Gospels and other Christian writings. They likely referred to the accounts provided in the New Testament, especially the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, for information about the birth of Jesus. These gospel accounts were considered authoritative within the Christian community. Church tradition. Early Christian communities had established certain traditions and teachings based on the accounts of Jesus' life and teachings. The writings of the church fathers often reflect the teachings and beliefs that were prevalent in the Christian communities of their time. Local records. It's possible that Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Eusebius had access to local records or traditions from specific regions that claimed to have preserved information about Jesus' birth. However, the availability and reliability of such records would have varied. Historical research, Eusebius in particular, is known for his historical writings, including his ecclesiastical history, in which he chronicled the history of the Christian church. He likely gathered information from a variety of sources, including a variety of earlier Christian writings, to compile his historical accounts. It's important to acknowledge that these early Christian writers were operating in a different historical context, just like other historians of the time were, and their methods of recording and transmitting information were shaped by the cultural and literary conventions of their time. While they may not have had access to the same kind of historical documentation that modern historians rely on, their writings provide valuable insights into the early Christian understanding of Jesus' life and birth. During the time of Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Eusebius, the availability of collections of writings and libraries varied, and access to information was quite different from today, which is a good example of why we should know that information availability everywhere to everyone is needed and necessary. 
here are some factors to consider. Christian writings. By the time of these historians, the collection of writings later most likely to make it into the New Testament were already well underway, and Christian communities had access to the Gospels, letters, and other writings that formed the basis of Christian theology and beliefs. Some early Christian writings not included in the New Testament, known as the Apostolic Fathers, from the late 1st to early 2nd century, were also available. These writings provided additional insights into the beliefs and practices of early Christians. Some New Testament writings were well established in some ways other than the councils that later created the canon of the New Testament. Before the formal councils that established the canon of the New Testament, there was an informal recognition and usage of certain writings within early Christian communities. Apostles' authorship or close association with apostles, writings attributed to eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and teachings, and were a significant criterion. Writings that aligned with the core beliefs of the Christian community were widely accepted. Some writings were incorporated into religious practices and public reading during worship. Commonly accepted writings used in gatherings contributed to their recognition and acceptance. Writings that were widely accepted and used across various Christian communities held greater weight. The consensus of multiple Christian communities played a role in the recognition of certain writings. In the 1st and 2nd century AD, the writings of early Christian leaders and authors reflected the use and acceptance of certain texts. These authors quoted and referenced specific writings in their works. Ignatius of Antioch lived from about 35 AD to about 107 AD and was the Bishop of Antioch, one of the early centers of Christianity. He is believed to have been a disciple of the Apostle John. Around the year 107, Ignatius was arrested for his Christian faith and was taken to Rome to face execution. During his journey to Rome, he wrote a series of letters to various Christian communities and leaders. These letters are known as the Ignatian Epistles. Polycarp lived from about 69 AD to about 155 AD and was a disciple of the Apostle John and became the Bishop of Smyrna, which is now Izmir, Turkey. Like Ignatius, Polycarp is known for his efforts to maintain the Orthodox Christian faith. He also emphasized the importance of unity within the church. He was arrested and executed for refusing to renounce his Christian faith. His martyrdom is described in the Martyrdom of Polycarp, an early Christian account of his trial and death. Clement of Rome lived from about 90 AD and is traditionally identified as the third bishop of Rome after Peter. His exact identity and the details of his life are not definitively known, but he is often associated with the Clement mentioned in Philippians 4, 3. Clement is best known for his letter to the Corinthian church, known as 1 Clement. This letter was written around 96 AD and addressed issues of disunity and improper conduct within the Corinthian community. It is one of the earliest Christian writings outside the New Testament. 1 Clement emphasizes the importance of humility in the church. Clement also appealed to the example of the apostles in his teachings. Early Christians believed certain writings carried divine authority and inspiration. The perception of a text as being divinely inspired contributed to its acceptance within the community. Reputation of authors and standing within the Christian community played a role and were more likely to have their writings accepted. Formal councils in the 4th century, along with later councils, provided official recognition to the 27 books that now constitute the New Testament. However, it's important to note that the councils did not create the canon, but rather recognized and formalized the existing usage and acceptance of certain writings within the Christian community. Canonization spanned several centuries and involved the ongoing efforts. The serve as a culmination and affirmation of the consensus that had developed over time regarding the authoritative and inspired nature of the New Testament writings. Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, both Jewish and Christian communities had access to the Hebrew scriptures, Old Testament, which played a foundational role in shaping religious thought and beliefs. In certain regions, local Christian communities may have maintained their own records, traditions, and writings. 
However, the reliability of such records could vary. In the Roman Empire, the existence of public libraries was not as widespread as it would become in later centuries. Alexandria in Egypt was known for its famous library, but access to such libraries would have been limited for many individuals. Wealthy individuals or institutions had private collections of scrolls and manuscripts. Oral transmission of information was still a prominent means of communication. Early Christian communities placed significant importance on oral traditions passed down by eyewitnesses and individuals with direct connections to the apostles. Local synods and councils held by Christian communities likely contributed to the preservation and dissemination of information. Affirmation at these gatherings sometimes resulted in written records. Eusebius, as a historian, likely engaged in historical research and gathered information from various sources. His work, Ecclesiastical History, reflects his efforts to compile a chronological account of the Christian church. While these historians did not have access to the extensive libraries and historical archives that modern historians enjoy, they made use of the resources available to them. Their writings provide valuable insights into the early Christian understanding of history, theology, and the life of Jesus Christ. The calculation of John the Baptist's birth based on the priestly course of Abijah involves tracing the information provided in the Gospel of Luke, particularly Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. Here's a summary of the relevant details. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, belonged to the priestly division or course of Abijah in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. The divisions of priests or courses were established during the time of King David and recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. As for the timing of Zacharias's temple service, according to Luke chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it was during Zacharias' assigned time of service in the temple that the angel Gabriel appeared to him and announced the forthcoming birth of John the Baptist. This would have been during one of the two annual visits to the temple that each priestly division made. After the angel's visit, Zacharias returned home, and Elizabeth, his wife, conceived, according to Luke chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, Elizabeth then concealed herself for five months, according to verse 24. We know when Zacharias served in the temple, based on the course of Abijah, so we can simply calculate the likely time of John's conception. Add the five months of Elizabeth's concealment, and you arrive at the most likely time period of John's birth. The priestly courses served in the temple twice a year. The courses began their service in the month of Nisan in the spring and Tishri in the autumn. Zacharias's service occurred during one of these months, which we can use to make an estimate. The Gospel of Luke mentions that Elizabeth conceived shortly after Zacharias's temple service. Adding five months to the time of Zacharias's service brings us to when John was born. Aligning with historical dates, we consider factors like the reign of Augustus, the death of Herod the Great, and other historical markers to arrive at an approximate date for John the Baptist's birth, which in this case is suggested to be uh, in 2 BC. And there are questions around the time of Herod the Great's death. It's not unusual. See, 4 BC is the year of Herod's death, but it is possible, and as far as some are concerned, probable, that uh, Herod the Great died in 1 BC based on historical sources, and other relative events. Here are some key points. An eclipse was mentioned by the Jewish historian Josephus, which some scholars have associated with the, the death of Herod. According to Josephus, this eclipse occurred shortly before Herod's death. It is believed that the eclipse took place on March 13th in the year 4 BC, but others suggest December 29th in the year 1 BC. Other historical resources refer to the writings of Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Eusebius, who provide additional information supporting the idea that Herod died in 1 BC. Transitions between calendars have made it difficult to identify timelines like this as well, along with the fact that there was no year zero between BC and AD that affects reviewing the years between different calendars since the events around Jesus' birth. Genealogical Considerations such as the reign of Augustus, to arrive at his proposed timeline for the birth of Jesus and the death of Herod. The census called for by Augustus Caesar in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Historians tried to determine the year of the census using the year of Herod's death and the eclipse. But, as mentioned before, these dates aren't aligned perfectly with the 4 BC time period. They are questionable. None of the options are universally accepted among historians and scholars, leaving interpretation open. But when aligned with the other events discussed in this commentary, they very well could align with each other and these events that coincide with Jesus' birth being in 2 BC. The Passover connection. If John the Baptist was born on Passover, April 19th or 20th in the year 2 BC, and Jesus was born 280 days later, according to the normal gestation time, and it would place Jesus' birth on September 29th of the year 2 BC, which coincides with the Feast of Trumpets. According to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 verses 5 through 24, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, belonged to the priestly order or course of Abijah. The priestly courses were divisions of priests who served in the temple in Jerusalem for one week at a time, twice a year. The course of Abijah was the eighth course according to 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 10. Now, to calculate this, we have to look at the timing of Zacharias' service. The Talmud and Josephus established that the destruction of the temple occurred on August 5th in the year 70 AD, and the first course of priests had just taken office. Tracking backward, Zacharias would have ended his duties on July 13th in the year 3 BC, since John the Baptist's birth took place 280 days later, according to normal gestation time. He would have been born on April 19th or 20th in the year 2 BC. Then John the Baptist's birth, as expected, coincides with Passover, given the context of the priestly courses. Also assuming a normal 280-day gestation period, the text suggests that Jesus would have been born on September 29th in the year 2 BC, which corresponds to the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, also known as Rosh Hashanah, is a Jewish festival celebrated on the first day of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. It involves the sounding of trumpets and is seen as a time of preparation for the coming Day of Atonement. Jesus was not born on or near December 25th, and the choice of this date for celebrating Christmas was decided based on pagan practices and has been a topic of historical and theological discussion. Several factors contribute to this perspective. The Bible does not provide a specific date for the birth of Jesus. The Gospels, which recount the Nativity story, offer details about the events surrounding Jesus' birth, but do not specify the exact day or month. The selection of December 25th for celebrating the birth of Jesus is often associated with the Roman holiday of Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a festival dedicated to the Roman god Saturn, celebrated around the winter solstice, which typically falls on December 21st or 22. During Saturnalia, there were feasts, gift-giving, and revelry. As Christianity became the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, some scholars argue that the date of December 25th was chosen to coincide with Saturnalia, possibly as a way to integrate and Christianize existing winter celebrations. In the early history of Christianity, the church faced the challenge of integrating and converting diverse pagan cultures. Some elements of pagan festivals and traditions were absorbed into Christian celebrations to make the transition more acceptable to the population. The date of December 25th became associated with the celebration of the Nativity, and over time, Christmas absorbed various customs, such as gift-giving and the use of evergreen trees, that were part of pre-existing pagan celebrations. Calendar and astronomical considerations also make the choice of December 25th align with the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, signifying the gradual return of sunlight. In ancient times, various cultures celebrated festivals around this time as a symbol of hope and renewal. Some theories suggest that early Christians might have chosen December 25th as the birth date of Jesus to counteract pagan celebrations and emphasize the symbolism of the light of the world coming into the darkness. In summary, the December 25th date for celebrating Christmas is not based on biblical evidence, but rather has historical and cultural influences.
The integration of existing traditions into Christian celebrations reflects the dynamic nature of religious practices and the adaptation of cultural customs over time. Different Christian denominations and scholars may have varied views on the historical origins of Christmas traditions. The term pagan was commonly used in the ancient world to refer to people who practiced traditions with multiple gods or did not acknowledge the Abrahamic God, the figure central to Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Christians called people pagan to make a distinction between themselves and those who they believe worship false gods. Christians brought pagan traditions into Christian holidays because those traditions were not seen as objectionable to Christian beliefs. For this to happen, Christians could not have seen these traditions as opposed to their understanding of the Christian faith, even close after Jesus' time. Christians saw celebrating Jesus' birthday as an alternative to be inviting to non-believers during a busy holiday season. How many Christians would consider bringing alternative traditions into our holidays now? It just wasn't a problem and the traditions stuck, so Christians still celebrate in those same traditions from pagan rituals. Some cultures rebranded many of those traditions and brought them forward with a strong zeal for the celebration. Even the date of December 25th wasn't associated with the birth of Jesus until many, many years later. Although even today there are Christian traditions that don't celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th. The connection between Babylonian traditions, particularly the Tammuz legend and certain Christmas customs, such as the Yule log and the Christmas tree, is a subject of historical and cultural interpretation. The Tammuz legend is an ancient Mesopotamian myth associated with fertility rituals, and some scholars suggest parallels between these ancient practices and later Christmas traditions. Here's a brief overview. Tammuz was a Sumerian god of vegetation, often associated with the annual cycle of death and rebirth in nature. According to the myth, Tammuz dies during the summer and is later resurrected, symbolizing the cycle of fertility and the changing seasons. The Yule Log tradition is associated with various winter solstice celebrations, including those of Norse and Celtic origin. In ancient times, a large log, often from a fruit-bearing tree, would be selected and burned in the hearth as part of winter festivities. Some scholars draw connections between the Yule Log and the Tammuz legend, suggesting that the burning of the log symbolizes the death and rebirth of the sun or the vegetation god. The use of evergreen trees as part of winter celebrations has ancient roots. In Norse and Celtic traditions, evergreen trees were believed to have protective and purifying properties. The Romans also used greenery in their celebrations of Saturnalia. The Christmas tree tradition, as it is known today, is often associated with Germany in the 16th century. Some theories propose that the Christmas tree has its origins in earlier pagan traditions, and the practice of decorating evergreen trees became popular during the Christmas season. The connection to the Tammuz legend is indirect, as some scholars suggest that the use of evergreen trees in winter celebrations may symbolize the enduring nature of life during the dormant winter months. And these connections are usually not effective today, and the history of holiday traditions is complicated. People have taken ideas from various cultures and times, making today's holidays diverse. People see these traditions in different ways, and some focus more on what they mean culturally or religiously. Other holidays have similar Christian and pagan mixtures. Halloween has ancient roots in the Celtic festival of Samhain, marking the end of the harvest season and the beginning of winter. Celts believe that during this time, the boundary between the living and the dead was blurred, allowing spirits to roam. Costumes and masks were worn to ward off malevolent spirits. As Christianity spread, November 1st became All Saints Day, and October 31st became All Hallows' Eve, later shortened to Halloween. Some traditions, like trick-or-treating, may have connections to medieval practices of souling, or going door-to-door -door for food in exchange for prayers for the dead. Easter's origins are intertwined with both Christian and pagan traditions. The name Easter is believed to have been derived from the Anglo-Saxon goddess Eostra, associated with spring and fertility. The timing of Easter, determined by the lunar calendar, often coincided with pagan spring festivals celebrating renewal and rebirth. In Christianity, Easter commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Easter bunny and eggs, symbols of fertility and new life, 
may have pagan origins but were later adopted into Christian Easter traditions. The blending of pagan and Christian elements reflects the assimilation of customs over time. Why do holidays of different kinds matter to social structures and do unsure specific details about the holidays matter? The holidays play a crucial role in social structures for several reasons. Cultural identity, holidays often reflect and reinforce cultural identity. They provide a sense of belonging and continuity, connecting individuals to a wide variety of cultural heritage, traditions, and shared values. Community building. Holidays bring people together, fostering a sense of community and shared experiences. Celebrating common traditions helps build social bonds, strengthen relationships, and promote a sense of unity. Emotional well-being. Holidays are often associated with positive emotions, joy, and celebration. Observing holidays can contribute to emotional well-being by providing moments of happiness, relaxation, and shared joy. Traditions. Holidays are marked by traditions that provide a framework for social interactions. These rituals can be comforting and create a sense of order and continuity in society. As for the uncertainty around specific details of holidays, it can matter to varying degrees. Historical and cultural understanding. Understanding the origins and historical context of holidays enriches cultural knowledge and promotes a deeper appreciation of diverse traditions by knowing why and how they developed into their current state. Interfaith and intercultural relations. Awareness of different holiday traditions can facilitate positive interactions between individuals from diverse cultural and religious backgrounds, fostering empathy and understanding. Personal meaning. While specific details may vary, the personal meaning individuals attach to holidays is crucial. The emotional and symbolic significance of holidays often transcends historical details. In summary, Holidays matter to social and individual structures because they contribute to cultural identity, community building, emotional well-being, belonging, and the reinforcement of values. While specific details may add depth to these celebrations, the broader importance lies in the shared experiences and connections they foster within societies. This presentation highlights the diverse origins of holidays such as Christmas, Halloween, and Easter underscoring that the significance of these celebrations is subjective and shaped by cultural and historical but mostly current influences. The conversation emphasized that the blending of traditions, whether Christian, pagan, or not religious at all, can foster unity and understanding among people. By recognizing the shared elements of various customs, individuals can come together to celebrate common themes such as joy, renewal, and goodwill. Ultimately, the goal of holidays is to contribute to the common good, promoting a sense of community and shared values that transcend differences. In this spirit, the willingness to embrace diverse traditions contributes to the richness of holiday celebrations and reinforces the idea that at their core, these occasions are about bringing people together in a spirit of joy, generosity, and unity. No matter what the date or year of Jesus' birth, the efforts of very early historians to identify the date is evidence that people knew Jesus was there, that he was special and his efforts, examples, and teachings were for bringing all people together, whether they agreed with him or each other or not. Less than 70 years after Jesus left, when they still had contact with first-hand knowledge, religious leaders and historians were gathering all the information they could including letters and manuscripts that were not included in the current New Testament. What this presentation doesn't tell us is, what does this information not tell us about the texts? And what are texts throughout the Bible screaming to let us know that we have been ignoring? Click the subscribe button to stay in the know. It's free and helps me bring these videos to you. Throughout history, powerful individuals have abused their positions for personal gain, Religion, commerce, government, even volunteerism haven't been immune. Greed seems to be the fuel for manipulation and ultimately for conflict. Jesus recognized this. He saw through the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and even Peter's attempts to control his destiny.
Jesus believed in empowering individuals, encouraging them to make their own choices. He wasn't against joy or celebration, but against exploiting religion or wealth for personal agendas against others. We're all susceptible to power's temptation. We minimize good, creating scarcity and competition. We forget that taking away what people need only breeds suffering and even violence. This chaos stems from those who hoard power and manipulate others, keeping them from pursuing the best in their own lives. Jesus offered a radical solution, radical selflessness. He urged us to prioritize others, even above our own comfort. He showed us that true worth doesn't lie in hoarding treasure or displaying wealth, but in building genuine community and practicing compassionate love. Let's honor Jesus' example by breaking free from manipulative systems and embracing genuine inclusivity. We can enjoy celebrations without seeking control or devaluing others. We can celebrate Jesus by following his message of empowerment and love, not so much through grandiose displays. Jesus' birthday isn't about Christmas. It's about challenging the very power structures that use him for their own purposes. It's about remembering that faith is personal, not something to be controlled or exploited. It's about stepping aside and letting others choose their own path. That's the true change Jesus calls for, a change in our hearts, not just our calendars. It's about dismantling arrogance, relinquishing control, and building a world where everyone thrives. That's where we truly honor Jesus. Think about it. How would your approach change if you began commemorating Jesus' exemplary love for all people, free from the commercialism and limitations of Christmas, which usually only indulge in temporary experiences that don't last? The top priority is to minimize financial expense and enhance genuine heartfelt expression and engagement. Here are some thoughts and ideas about how this can be done. Create personalized, handmade gifts that require as little expense as possible, even using materials that are normally trashed when possible. Do something you've never done before to help those in need. Join in a group dinner, carry in, or going out, and make sure others are paid for who can't afford it. Socialize. Dine and enjoy time with others unlike yourself. Believe different than you do. Have different priorities than yours. Spend hours or more with someone who you think you disagree with. But don't judge or discourage, just ask for their thoughts and experiences and listen. Write a letter of apology correctly, accepting all responsibility without turning the tables or giving excuses, even if the thing being apologized for was not your fault. Write a letter of appreciation to express gratitude and appreciation for people in your life and promote a positive and affirming atmosphere. Remember that you don't have to be involved with toxic people to appreciate and encourage good things about them. Tell stories you've seen or experienced through your personal journey that foster understanding and empathy. This can be done in person, online, using video, writing, audio recordings, and other means. Make gift of time certificates to give certain people to offer your time to talk, fellowship, help with tasks, etc. Invite some people together to do something beneficial to everyone there. Prepare and preserve foods, art, and expressions to convey messages of unity, love, and acceptance. Invite diverse people to share and get to know each other. Nature walk, share a skill, plan and share a special book discussion, etc. Visit a religious gathering that you've never experienced before and make it a point to talk with and get to know people who are there, attend a workshop, or watch media that provides cultural diversity, inclusivity, and social justice to promote awareness and inspiration. Do a random act of generosity that you haven't done before, where participants surprise others with unexpected gifts, gestures, or assistance. Assemble a community installation of a display in a public space, bulletin board, billboard, museum, park, community center, plaza, etc., with artworks, reports, pamphlets, entertainment, talent showcase, etc., expressing love and inclusivity for all people. Organize a global connection event for people around the world to share their stories and experiences by video at education, religious, public, and other locations. Encourage audience participation and to submit questions and comments for you to share during the event. Bring someone else along for these experiences. Share your experiences online or in a personal news type letter. We don't have to organize or establish a special day. There's no requirement to set up or formalize a specific day. It's just good to have a special day as a reminder and re-motivator. 
with expressions of love for all people as a reminder and rekindle motivation. Christmas has evolved to serve other meaningful purposes. What ideas do you have for ways to celebrate love for all people that reflects Jesus' examples? Share them in the comments with this video. Decorative light displays are wonderful representations of life and love, and quality over quantity would be more meaningful. If people only knew how much I love light displays. I've had displays of hundreds of thousands of lights, but I'll take more of a meaningful display anytime. I appreciate any and all efforts, especially for those who don't have much doing what they can. But for those throwing millions of lights all over everywhere, let's find appreciation of specific meaning in displays for a more humble celebration, because the light of the world is the meaning and personification of love for all people. Use lights that are neon and representative of infrared, indigo, and ultraviolet light with deep red representing the core color of all others begin from. Deep red doesn't represent the blood of Jesus or the cross in the celebration of Jesus' birthday, but exemplifies love of and connection with all people. Deep red is meant to represent the hot core and equatorial heat that all social structures and interactions originate from. All colors, shades, neon, and mixtures exist between the deep red and ultimate dimensions of individuals, societies, and existence. Predimensional and extra-dimensional representations of faith, hope, and confidence. They are the ultimate states of structures and existence with love for all people using representative colors for infrared, indigo, and ultraviolet. The appearance of disconnecting at least some lights from electrical and energy sources represents connections that aren't physically seen or immediately perceived. More and more, I believe we will be moving toward solar strings of lights and lighted displays. Whatever day you choose to associate with love for all people, whether it be a date researched for Jesus' birthday or not, is good. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth exploration of the birth date of Jesus, delving into its significance and reflecting on how we can enhance the celebration by focusing on its true meaning rather than just gifts and displays. As we navigate the rich tapestry of history, traditions, and diverse perspectives, may this journey inspire us to embrace the essence of love, compassion, and unity that Jesus symbolizes. Let us carry forward the spirit of celebration in ways that resonate with the heart of the message, fostering understanding and goodwill among us. Holidays, symbolism, and meaningfulness are what you make of them. Anything can be made into good or not. Remember, the choice to make everything about the knowledge of good and evil is yours. Choose to prioritize life over knowledge of good and evil. Celebrate the good of having fun, mocking bad views of ghosts and goblins. Celebrate the good of giving and loving rather than making a big deal about things you disagree with. Thank you for joining me on this insightful journey, and may your celebrations be filled with profound meaning and joy. Here's to wishing you meaningful holidays, however you choose to celebrate them. Click the subscribe button to stay in the know. It's free and it helps me bring more pointed and in-depth videos to you. This is Robbie Oosley. Thank you for watching.